And he said, Megan, why are you crying? And I said, because I've been nothing but mean to all of you. I've, I, I quit believing in you. I, I, I don't know what to do. And here you are being so nice to me. And I don't feel like a very good Catholic. I didn't know this. I don't know these things. You know, why are you being so nice to me? And I remember he looked at me and he was just so sincere and gentle. He said, Megan, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to love you. And I thought, wow, wow, you're here to love me. How wonderful. This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, everybody. Welcome and welcome to my guest, Megan Brown. Hello, Megan. Hello, Heather. Thank you. Oh, it is so great to have you here. We bumped into each other briefly at the IONS conference, which is the International Association for Near-Death Studies. So hopefully we still have that afterglow of the conference with us. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. That was really fun. It was. It was a, an amazing conference. Uh, so many great people. I loved meeting everyone. And um, people were sharing their story. And you have an amazing story. So you were an atheist. You were really against anything to do with God. And then you died. So take us to the events that unfolded that brought you to the hospital. Okay, so I'm going to back up and go. My childhood was, I was raised Catholic. And because of a rape at age 20, I became an atheist. And then I was an atheist for 18 years, hardcore, didn't believe in anything. Um, what got me sick was um, I, I had this stomach ache and I, I just I worked out with my trainer that day and I was, you know, living life, right? And I just got this really bad stomach ache that kept getting worse and worse where I had to drive myself to the hospital in the middle of the night and they didn't know what to do with me. I went back to the hospital because they just sent me home, uh, you know, having given me a, a shot for pain. And then the pain got uh, just horrible. Long story short, I go from that hospital because I had to go back. And then they didn't know what to do with me. They said she needs um, a gastroenterologist. So we don't have one here at this hospital. I was in a small town. So then I was driven by ambulance 52 miles to another hospital. And that's where I spent the next eight weeks. And they diagnosed me at first with C. difficile colitis. And I'd never had this before. I've never had it since. And it was so strange. And I was in so much pain. And I had a really severe case. And that can kill you. But then what started happening was the pain moved. And, and, and literally, I mean, it was getting worse and worse. And it moved into my back. And I remember pleading with these nurses and this hospitalist, just, just, I'm telling them all every detail that I can tell them about the pain, but they kept brushing me off. And finally the hospitalist, cause I kept ringing the nurse's station. I was, I was insistent on getting somebody to get me a doctor that will come in and listen to me. So the doctor came in at one point again, and he said, I've, you know, I've given you this medicine. I've, I'm done. Basically, he said he didn't know what to do. But what they didn't tell me was that I was turning gray and I had gained 43 pounds of fluid in three days. And he, he just didn't know what to do with me. So for the first time, I heard a voice and it was just me and the doctor in the room. I heard a voice say, make a scene, make it big, or you won't make it out. And I'm like, who, who just said that? Because the doctor didn't say it to me. So what I did was I started yelling at him. And I thought, well, all I have is my family, my husband and my son. And I thought, my son needs me, my husband needs me, you know, and I made a scene. I was in a Catholic hospital, so I knew what to say. And I made a, a scene and he looked at me as though I was just throwing a tantrum. But then I grabbed the bed rails and I shook the bed rails and made a bigger scene yelling and 
using the F word, using, you know, Jesus Christ. And I mean, I literally went off on this guy and I said, you're fired. So I fired my doctor and he looked at me for a moment and then he still wasn't getting it. And then I had to keep like yelling at him and I was directing him out because the medicine he was giving me was not working for the pain. I was at the point where, okay, this is so severe. You're not, you're not it. So finally another hospitalist came in. I don't know how long the time was that went by, but she could see, I mean, she looked at the nurse that I threatened to fire. She could see, oh my God, this woman, she's got a problem. Has anybody checked her creatinine level? which are the kidneys. And the nurse looked through all the pages and she said, no. So that's when they realized, oh, we need to check her creatinine level. And it, and then they all went, oh my God, she's, she's in kidney failure. So I was in kidney failure and it had been going on for days because this was like day four, I was in the hospital and they didn't, they didn't check anything around my kidneys. So I was in real, I was in a lot of pain and, and I've heard, you know, kidney failure is not painful, but in fact, it was. <laughs> so for me. And from there, what happened to proceed to go into your near-death experience? Um, I was taken to dialysis and I remember um, the head nurse came up to me and she was asking my permission to give me a blood transfusion. And I have one of my brothers when we were young had friends who were hemophiliacs and from their blood transfusions, they'd um, gotten AIDS. So this was back in, I want to say, oh God, this was the eighties. And I thought, oh my God, I could get AIDS from this blood transfusion. So I, I said to the nurse, well, what about the diseases? What about what about AIDS? And she just repeated herself very firmly and said, we need to change your blood out. Do I have your permission? So then I heard a voice again and it said, say yes. So I did. And when I said yes, I just relaxed. I just relaxed and then they did whatever they needed to do. And the next thing I remember is, um, I don't even remember all of the details of the machinery and all of this stuff because I went from blood transfusions to, you know, dialysis and then followed by plasma phoresis. They were still doing tests on me. And then they figured out, oh my gosh, she has this really rare autoimmune disease called TTP HUS. And then they realized, oh, this is an emergency. This is so severe. This could literally kill her. And, um, so they had to change things up for me. And um, it, it's a blood disease and they don't know how I got it. It didn't apply with any of the tests that they had given me. So it's a mystery to me still, except to say now I know that it was heaven sent. But getting back to your question, um, I, I remember walking through the clouds and I see Jesus standing over to my left and I looked at him and it's like a park setting. You know, you go to a park, it's green grass. There are trees all around when I was seeing him. And I thought, huh. And there's, you know, the sky above, the clouds, birds in the sky. And I looked at Jesus and I said, oh my God, you really do exist. That was my greeting to him. And he smiled, opened up his arms, indicating for me to come forward and give him a hug. So I did. I gave him a hug. And then he turned me to walk with him. And we, he said, um, we have a lot of work to do. And I said, I know you're dealing with me. So I, I thought, yes, um, I'm an atheist. I mean, this, I, I don't even know what I'm here for. And that's what I kept thinking. Like, why am I here? Am I dying? I don't want to die. I was afraid of dying at that time. I didn't want to die. But he took me to meet my other guides, Archangel Michael, Mother Mary, El Moria, and St. Germain. They were all waiting for me at a golden capsule. It's kind of like a small, it was just this small 
room, but it was all gold on the outside. And I had to go in and watch my life review. I, I didn't know what was going to be happening. And I remember thinking, oh my God. So you have to feel everything again. You have to hear everything again. Not only what you were thinking, but what the other people were thinking and what they were feeling at all times. There's not a moment of your life that is missed. Not a moment of your life. So that was, um, that was huge. But then Archangel Michael, we all stepped out of the golden capsule and I had to follow him. I mean, we were all together, but then Archangel Michael took me into his own golden capsule. And I remember thinking like, oh my God, he is so powerful and so incredibly gentle, but you just don't want to get on the bad side. Like you just know, yeah, this is, this is somebody I would not, I would not want to cross, you know? Um, but he was so incredibly beautiful as a soul. He was incredibly beautiful looking. Everybody in heaven was beautiful. Everybody, everybody was beautiful. I remember he was speaking to me and I was, I started to cry and then I had to stand up and, and then he, I, um, he ordered me to, um, lean, tilt my head back and hold my arms out to the side. And I did. And I had tears just streaming down my cheeks and he was holding his right hand up and there was this white flame coming out of his hand into my soul. And he was saying the Aramaic version of Psalm 91. And, and when he was finished, he looked at me and he said, Megan, why are you crying? And I said, because I've been nothing but mean to all of you. I've, I, I quit believing in you. I, I, I don't know what to do. And here you are being so nice to me. And I don't feel like a very good Catholic. I didn't know this. I don't know these things, you know, why are you being so nice to me? And I remember he looked at me and he was just so sincere and gentle. He said, Megan, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to love you. And I thought, wow, wow, you're here to love me. How wonderful. And after we were finished there, the angels, there were two cherubs that came in and they dressed me um, in this white toga. I call it a toga because I don't know what else to say, but there was this um, stole that was put over me by the angels. And on the bottom right of the stole in the front was a picture of earth. And then there were seven flames coming out of it. And I remember that was to indicate that I was a visitor from earth. Then I remember we stepped outside of his capsule and there were my other guides. All of us walked a short distance and there was a little bridge. We walked over and we went into temple. It was a beautiful white temple. And as we were approaching, there were um, two decks, one on each side of the doors above. And they were, um, they, there were two cherubs, all gold and they were playing trumpets, uh, uh, like announcing that we were coming. And Jesus went and opened the door and my other guides went in and then I went in. And remember, I didn't want to be here. I, I didn't want to die. I, I was so just like, okay, whatever we're doing, I want to be done with it. And I, I was still thinking, Okay, can the doctors just figure this out back in the hospital? Can they just figure this out? I just want to go home. I was in great shape, right? But that's not what happened. So when I stepped foot, first of all, when I walked in, I saw so many souls sitting at the table. It was this giant gold table. And I didn't know... I mean, I, I recognized Paramahansa Yogananda. I recognized Mahatma Gandhi. I recognized Jesus and Archangel Michael now and my guides, but I didn't know who anybody else was there. And 
I remember um, I, I, it's, it's almost as if I floated to my chair because it was, it was unbelievable, the feeling that I felt. It was so incredible. This was a warmth and a comfort level I had never felt in my life. This was love. And Jesus had pulled out my chair so that I could go sit down. And I'm looking around the table and I'm like, holy God, who am I sitting here with? And then this old man starts talking at the head of the table. Like Jesus is to my left, Archangel Michael's to my right. And then there's some old guy sitting to Jesus's left at the head of the table. And, and everybody, he starts talking and everybody starts listening. And I'm looking around the table like, why are they listening to him? I, I didn't understand. I really did not understand what was going on around me. I mean, I knew I felt so comfortable. But then he said, he announced, and Megan will be going back to earth. And in that moment, I thought, literally, I only thought, oh, and he stops talking and he looked directly in my eyes. And then, then I realized this was God. Because in the Catholic Church, as a child, I remember they used to say, be careful what you think, because God hears your thoughts. This was in catechism classes. And here I was sitting in front of God. So then I really started to feel uncomfortable and because I realized, oh, I'm swearing, you know, from what God just told me. And I looked at him and my eyes widened and I said, oh, your holiness. I, I'm so sorry. I, I I didn't realize that you were God and and he could see me just kind of squirming in my seat. And he let me feel uncomfortable for, for a few seconds. And it was okay. It was very, he wanted to see what I would say, how I would start behaving. Well, clearly I had just said the wrong thing. So I, I was very apologetic. And he said, I'm not offended, Megan. It's a man-made word. And he said, um, but be careful what you think and be careful what you wish for, because I hear those too. And I have never forgotten him saying that. So I looked around the table and everybody is just staring at me. It wasn't like a cold stare. It was a stare of, well, I wonder how she's going to respond now. Because I was kind of looking around at everybody like, did I offend everybody? You know, and then God said, we want you to feel comfortable. And I didn't even know what to do with that. And I remember thinking like, no one's ever told me in my life, I just want you to feel comfortable with love. I mean, I'm talking about those that love me. And I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, saying anything negative about anybody in my life. I'm just saying I've never, ever heard it like that, ever. And I remember I was in this gold chair because everybody was, they were all sitting in these golden chairs and then God and goddess straight across from him. Um, they had these giant gold chairs that with these big, um, backs, and then there were stones like diamonds, uh, giant, huge emeralds, sapphires, rubies. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. What, you know? I'd never seen anything like this. And so then I just put my arms over my chair and I said, well, then shit, I'm just going to sit here and be myself. And they all started laughing. So it was in that moment that I realized, oh, everybody here has a sense of humor. This is great, you know? So I was really glad about that. And then I felt very comfortable. But then God spoke again. And this was just in the first five minutes of me being at this table. And he said, and about that abortion, I thought, oh, oh, here it comes. I'm going to hell because that was, I had an abortion as a result of my rape. I was, I got pregnant from a rape and that's what turned me into an atheist because I thought if there's any sort of God, why would a God or heaven, what I've grown up, you know, being told exists, why would they allow me to be raped in my own bed? 
at home. Why? You know, I, I didn't understand that. So then I, then I was just completely, okay, this is all fairy tale talk. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to hear anything about religion. It's extinct in my head. So I thought in that moment, I didn't believe in heaven. I didn't believe in God. And I thought, well, this is probably where hell is going to come in and I'm going to be punished for it. And, you know, God looked right at me and he said, Megan, you can't kill a soul. He said, you just sent him back to us to take care of him for you until you were ready. Now he's waiting for you on earth. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, your son, your son is, was waiting for you at home. And I said, wait, I, I was confused. I, I, I literally, so he reincarnated. This is when I was trying to figure out what reincarnation was. And he says, yes, because there were two things God said to me there. I didn't understand. And I, and then I, I remember asking him, is reincarnation real? And he said, oh yes. And you've had many lifetimes. And I said, well, I'd like to know why this lifetime has been so difficult. And he said, because you chose three lives in one. You didn't want to reincarnate. I said, oh, great. So I don't have to go back. So, so I'm here. I can stay. Right? And he said, no. He said, you're going to be going back. I said, I have to go back to earth. So there was this whole conversation at his table about that. And I clearly am here, but I had to come back. But there were reasons why, and he didn't allow me to remember everything. Um, but I remember I've gotten, I had, to, I was ordered to stand up and walk around the table and receive messages from all 76 of them. Every single one of them had a message for me. And it was so powerful for me. And I remember when I got to Goddess, she looked at me and she said, Megan, it's okay to be yourself. We, we just want you to be yourself. And she was so gentle and so incredibly beautiful and so sincere and loving. It was, oh, it, it was just this beautiful moment, beautiful moment. And then I remember after her, I saw White Eagle. White Eagle was a chief. I don't remember which Indian tribe, and my grandmother had given me this book when I was like 14 or something called The Quiet Mind by White Eagle. And she knew that my mother had veered off track of Catholicism and got into Hinduism. So she thought, well, let me give her this. You know, my grandmother, all of my grandparents were Catholic. And so she gives me this little book and I'd read it and it was great. It was beautiful. It was little positive poems and stuff. So here, here I am standing before him in heaven and he had this beautiful, incredible white headdress on and he was wearing all white. And he looked up at me and he said, Megan, when you come across a white feather, I want you to ask yourself, are you doing or are you being? And I looked at him and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't want to answer this incorrectly. And I was thinking like, how do I answer this? And he sees, he sees me probably, you know, struggling for the answer in my head. And he said, no, 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 I don't want you to answer this. You don't have to answer it. He said, I just don't want you to forget it. I have never forgotten it. And as a matter of fact, I've gotten white feathers throughout since that happened. And I just got another white feather when I was taking my dog out for a walk the other day. And there was a little tiny white feather and I went, oh, white eagle, thanks, you know. So I received a lot of messages around God's table. Do you remember most of the messages? No, I don't. The ones that I do remember, um, I openly talk about, um, but there were so many more that I don't remember. Like um, Sitting Bull was directly to the right of goddess. I don't remember what he said to me. I remember I had to meet with him um, even after this experience at God's table, I had to meet with Sitting Bull. Um, I, I, I saw Prophet Muhammad there. I saw um, 
Kuan Yin. I saw Kali. I saw Vishnu, Lakshmi, um, Krishna. I, I, these, all of these souls were there, but I don't remember their specific messages for me. What were a couple that you remember? Um, the other one I remember, well, it was from God himself. So after walking down the table, I had to, oh no, wait, it, it was Mahatma Gandhi. I remember Mahatma Gandhi. He said to me, Megan, with peace comes resistance. And I thought, well, you should know. And he, he did, you know, he was trying to be peaceful in what he was trying to do. But I thought, okay, that's powerful. Then um, when I, I should back up here. In that first five minutes also, when God and I talked about the abortion, before he told me that, he said, you're going back and you're writing a book. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not a writer. He said, I don't care. And I thought, okay, but I'm not an English major. I, I, I've i never written a book before. And he said, I don't care. I still don't care. You know, I mean, it was warm, but it was also firm. Like you're going to do this. Huh. Okay. So now getting back when I'd gone around the table, all 76 of them, I wind up back with God and I'm standing next to him, his left side. And he's looking up at me and I looked at him and he said, Megan, when you, he says, think about this, you're driving a car and I'm your passenger. He says, we come to a fork in the road. What are you going to do? Are you going to go left or are you going to go right? And I remember looking at him like, I don't know what the answer is here. I don't know what the correct answer is. And he said, you don't have to answer this. He said, either way you go. I'm always going to be your passenger. And I thought, oh, that is so cool. You're always going to be my passenger. And I don't remember what else he said while I was standing there next to him, but I remember that. And then I remember asking him, I said, may I ask you a question? And it was all very respectful. Everything was with love. Um, I said, may I ask you a question? And he said, yes. And I said, may I touch your cheek? And everybody was watching me and he said, yes. So I took my right hand to his left cheek and I just touched his cheek for just, I don't know how long, a few seconds. And it was such a privilege and I felt very honored. And it was this beautiful reciprocal understanding of how powerful love is. So in other words, touching his cheek, he is love. He is love. And he's honoring my desire to feel what love, what love feels like. He's in power. And, um, so it was really, it was really a privilege. And then I, I remember I took my hand back and I looked at him and I smiled and I said, now I can tell everybody that I've touched the face of God and everybody smiled, everybody smiled. And I remember when I very first shared that because I never forgot it many years ago and people looked at me and said, well, then you died. Oh no, you couldn't have touched the face of God. God doesn't allow that and blah, blah, blah. And oh, as the years have gone on, so I, I stopped telling people about that because I thought, okay, well, I did touch the face of God. I know who I touched. Um, why do people need to feel like they're so right about what my experience is? So then it's only been in the past couple of years where I've started talking about actually touching the face of God. And it's been said to me, well, then you died. Well, it was a near death experience. I don't know if they ever pronounced me dead. I know that 90% of my body, I remember this. They told me 90% 90, 90 of your body shut down. You're dying. I mean, they knew I was dying. 
And I had nurses, two nurses tell me that and a doctor. So I was in the process of, yes, dying. But did they ever pronounce me dead? Not to my knowledge. So, but I did touch the face of God. But then after that was over, I, and I, I want to pause here in case you have any questions because it just keeps going. So I don't want to keep going. I mean, there's more, but. I know you have so much more to your story, but let's go ahead and take that into part two. Okay, great. I always love talking to all of my guests and Megan is no exception. She has one of the most unique near-death experiences that I've heard. So I hope you enjoyed it and things get even more interesting and more unique as we go into part two. And here's a look. It is love who designed my life. And this just, it has opened up into so many different ways of understanding within me since that moment that I, I really want to share this with everybody. You know, Jesus had me really, really take in my life differently with a new set of eyes, with a new set of ears, with a new understanding. There were all of these cherubs that started flying into my tent and these golden cherubs, and it was like lighting up the room. And in walked Prophet Muhammad. And he, we all immediately stood. I think a lot of you are really going to like part two. Now, it is different, but I love hearing all the different perspectives. By the way, I'd love to hear your thoughts here about part one. Uh, please share your thoughts in the comments. And then also, if you prefer, just to say you made it, just go ahead and write those words in the comments. I always really appreciate that. If you haven't subscribed, please do that. And also hit the bell icon if you'd like to get notified when new episodes come out. And I do have new episodes coming out twice a week. And then also, you can always find all of my episodes if you go to my playlist. And I'll always have a link to that in the description. And I don't think I've mentioned it yet. So if you can give it a like, I appreciate that as well. Thank you so much, most of all, just for being here today. I am so grateful for you. And I hope to see you in part two. Thanks for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. Please add comments and questions you'd like future guests to answer. Also, if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. That'll help keep this podcast going. You can also go to Beyond with Heather Tesh to look for more episodes.